Not your usual start to a program, but axe throwing, escape rooms and urban golf, where they may not sound like your usual after work activities. However, more and more young people are taking part in what's called competitive socializing. For a generation supposedly known for an obsession with being online, why are these offline activities on the rise? OK, we'll get rid of this for pretty obvious reasons, but apparently more than half of UK millennials would prefer to spend money on experiences rather than possessions. And competitive social events such as axe throwing or crazy golf are one way they are doing this. But is it more than just a fad? <laughs> Sometimes a simple meal or coffee with friends just won't cut it. This is what competitive socialising looks like. Getting together with mates to play activities or take part in a competition. Cakes and Ladders in London is centred around traditional board games set up by millennials for millennials just over a year ago. We're passionate about board games. Um, we, we wanted to set up a board game cafe and really bring face-to-face -face interaction um, to people. Um, we believe that board games are like a really good way for people to socialise. Other types of competitive socialising include axe throwing, shuffleboard or urban golf. Over half of UK millennials would rather spend money on experiences than possessions, according to marketing group Inkling. Another big part of this sector are these escape rooms, whether in a nuclear bunker or zombie apocalypse. Teams of up to six people are locked in a room. Through a series of clues, the aim is to escape before the clock runs out. This trend is a part of the UK's booming experience economy, with millennials spending $533.5 million a month on live events. So is competitive socialising a fad or part of a bigger change to how we interact with our friends? So let us play our own little game, roll the dice here at the round table with us, Jules Whitehorn, co-founder of Whistlepunk's Urban Axe Throwing Company. Yasha Estrex here, an associate partner at Piper Private Equity. Is it good business? Benjamin Mercer is Games Master at Escape Rooms in London and Hal Sedgwick Jell is here too, co-founder of Cakes and Ladders, a board game cafe. Um, it's pretty obvious to me why I got rid of that axe, because I am a danger to myself. Have you ever lost anybody, Jill? No, no, we have a 100% success rate. It's, uh, it's all very carefully managed, and uh, we're all about the fun with the safety. Well, what happens? What happens? Uh, in an average session, you come in, uh, you get given a safety briefing, and an instructor takes you through ha how to throw an axe safely and competently, because... You're in a cage, you aren't you? I mean, it's not like you could go astray. No, that's right. We have caged in lanes so that there's, you know, people are going to miss the first time, the first few times. Um, so it's all, it's all very carefully managed. And these things, the one I just felt just now was razor sharp. Are they all like that? Uh, some are sharper than others. It depends how, how well they've been maintained. But uh, they're sharp enough to stick in the wood at the end of the target and with not too much force. That's the real main And force. escape rooms is something I'd heard of before. I knew about axe throwing, etc. Mm. So board games, of course, we all know about. Uh, but Escape rooms I'd heard of, I've never been in one. Are they claustrophobic? They vary wildly. Um, some of them are more claustrophobic than others. We've got four. One of them has a claustrophobic element. Two people get sort of confined away in some... I get told off for calling them coffins because it puts people off, apparently. But um, <laughs> and why, why would it coffins, do that? I don't honestly know. But apparently people don't like the idea of being locked in coffins. But these things get closed behind them. That can be a little bit claustrophobic. Um, Perhaps you two should get fun. together. We should. Have an axe ray competition at a coffin. That could be, yeah, with somebody inside the coffin, but okay. I'm not sure they'd All enjoy right. it very you, much. You didn't hear it here first. Board games, yes. Howell, I mean, they're, they're fun, but you've got how many? Hundreds? Uh, so we've got 400 and counting, approximately, which, you know, we're on a double-decker bus, so there's a limit to how many we can squeeze on there. But, but it doesn't move around, this double-decker, does it? No, it's it, in one place. it stays put people, up yeah. in North London, where it lives. Um, because we need the electricity and the beer and everything to be connected to it, so not going anywhere anytime yeah, sure. soon. I'll get to you about the business side in, in just a moment, but it, each one of you, why did you get into this? Is it because 
you were fed up with other aspects of, of life as a, as a young person? Or it just seemed like fun? Uh, I think, well, I think we're all looking for opportunities to bring a bit of, well, to find a business that works and the kind of niche that is opening up uh, and also inject a bit of fun into things. So uh, I previously, with a friend of mine who I set up Whistlepunks with, we did bubble football and then we did combat archery, which is a bit like dodgeball with foam tipped arrows. And then we saw that uh, urban axe throwing has become a huge trend in North America. And it just looked like something that wasn't available in the UK and really had that kind of thrill, excitement, um, slight kind of danger element that makes it feel like something you couldn't do elsewhere in a city. You couldn't do it at home, could you? No, exactly. Not unless you're out in the country. You know, people do it out in the woods um, where there's plenty of space, but bringing it side by side, competitive, social, you're throwing next to each other every every shot. Uh, and it's that and you're how far away from this piece of wood? About four Which has metres. got a target? Four, four metres. Yeah. Es escape rooms, Benjamin. Why? Why? Well, speaking... For you, for you. For yeah. me personally, I um, was out City University studying, funnily enough, to become a journalist. And um, I needed a job. My best friend worked at our Angel venue, which is right next door. And needing a part-time job, it was, you know, do you go for bar work? Do you go stack shelves? Or do you find something which not very many people can say that they've done, which is not the usual job. It's curious. You, It's very, very different. And um, it appealed to me also because my friend worked there. So I found the job there. For speaking for the boss, my, my boss is the god king of escape rooms. I mean, he. Um, brought one of the first ones over to this country about five years ago. And I think it's based on, a, on an online game, so sort of into the link between the online offline world. And um, it was a Japanese mobile app game, um, which he thought would be quite a good idea if we made it into a real physical immersive experience. Just, just to be clear, for those that don't know what, what happens, you, you get put in a room yeah. and you have to answer certain questions and puzzles to find your way out. Yeah, it's, it's a combination. There's riddles, logic-based puzzles, some physical-based puzzles, mm. crawling over lasers, shooting space Nazis with laser guns in one of our particular rooms. There's a slide involved in one of them, which is always good fun. The puzzles, one of the reasons escape games have proliferated so much over the last five years is because the concept is so simple, which is that you are just locking people in rooms for the puzzles. But the extent of the puzzles is just it's limited only by the imagination of whoever happens to be creating them. So it's a very easy concept, very easy to set up, but they're also very different from each other. You see, we are led to believe, aren't we, Dasha? And I promise I will come to you in just a moment. We are led to believe that millennials are hooked on a virtual life. And th this says exactly the opposite. Is that what you found? I think for me, certainly, board games are a very non-digital way to spend your time. And there does seem to be an increasing popularity among younger people to come and get around a table with some cardboard, you know, bits of plastic. And they're a great way to interact. They kind of put you in situations, you know, you've got these kind of party games or hidden identity games, social deduction, which make groups interact in ways that, you know, you wouldn't if people are sat around a pub or with their phones out. Well, we, we'll, we'll get on in just a moment into, in, into the idea that this is not ex one is not exclusive of the other, that a virtual world is not necessarily excluded from these real-life activities, that you can bring the two together. But, Yasha, I did promise, this is big business, or it's becoming that way now, isn't it? Um, it, it is becoming, actually. And essentially, the UK has become innovative in the space globally, whereas typically we get a lot of our trends and a lot of our inspiration from the US. Actually, UK businesses are leading the charge in this area. What we're seeing is a lot of fascinating concepts that are um, actually being exported out, out to the States as well. Um, and increasingly... Well, such as? Well, for example, Flight Club has opened up... Uh, Flight Club, so this is a, a darts bar. So it's a kind of tech-led darts bar where you, you, you... It's not your typical darts game where, you know, a spit and sawdust pub, smoke-filled rooms. This is a, you know, a kind of booths where groups of women and men throw uh, darts at a board and it's all digitally... Um, it's, uh, it's all digitally led. Um, you've got... Um, Putt shack. Putt shack, shack. Yeah, you've got things like golf. that. Mini golf. Yeah. And they're all slow. Urban golf's become a big one, hasn't it? Yeah, of different, of different sorts. I mean, there's, there was a... Well, there was a big surge a, a few years back of, of, I think the brand was, urban golf, of people kind of practising their golf on a virtual course against a screen. Uh, but now it's become very much more like the sort of crazy golf, mini golf sort of, that you might have out the kind of the council garden, not council gardens, but like, you know, public gardens places. Yeah, yeah, yeah the old parks, the old public, yeah, small public so that's parks. that's come much more alongside yeah. the, the, the... It's, it's like crazy golf, 
brought inside, if you like, because there's one in the yeah. centre of London, several in the centre of London here. Yeah. Uh, right. One in near Oxford Circus, they've taken over an old part of a, a department store. What do you think young people are saying? Or is it just exclusively young people? In, in my experience, certainly not. Um, I, I find the, 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 the sort of the obsessive focus on millennial culture to be a little bit bizarre. I only found out what a millennial was about two months ago. Before that, I Are thought, you one? Apparently I am. And <laughs> I was shocked, surprised and horrified. To I don't think it. I am. Possibly not, but I mean, apparently millennials are responsible for ruining absolutely every good thing in the world. From no, that um, was my generation. Well, millennials <laughs> blame your generation for it, but a bit, your generation then blames millennials for ruining everything from '90s TV sitcoms to um, just basic, you know, diets and all the rest of it. Apparently, millennials are some new sort of species of snowflakes. Snowflakes, homo avocados. That's not my. That's um, not my. Anyway, let's. Just yeah, but <laughs> I, I find the obsession. Just trying to get the bizarre. generational thing in this. But millennials. And it occurred to me when I found out that I was, in fact, a millennial, Shakara, that the description we normally give of millennials and their interests did not apply to me, and nor did it apply to almost anybody else that I know, most of whom are also millennials. The idea that we are some new species who does things solely online, homo internetus, homo avocados, is just, it's bizarre to me. Actually, millennials are normal, functioning human beings, members of the same species, pattern-seeking, fun-loving, intelligent, for the most part, with one or two notable exceptions. Um, and you know, we all have families and we are obliged occasionally to go out with. We all have events which we go to with friends. We always like to do this. This is not new. And it's not something millennials are alien to either. So speaking for escape rooms, we, we don't have an over-representation of millennials amongst our customer base, for example. Um, we don't have an under-representation either. But I don't really see this, this divergence that's supposed to exist between yeah. millennial trends and everybody else. I suppose what, what you're saying is that this is not a fad. This is something that's been around as long as people wanted to have yeah. fun. It's just in a different form. Fundamental, I think the fundamental... Fundamental. The fu well, fundamental, fun. very good, yeah. very good. Um, or not, I think the fundamental you consumer behaviour, I don't know if you agree, is exactly the same as it's always been. People are looking, and probably young people are looking for memorable nights out, or memorable days out. But I think the way that the industry is servicing that need is changing. So before it was good enough just to have a bar where you could get a glass of wine, um, before it, maybe it was good enough just to play kind of, kind of crazy mini golf, you know, get the ball through kind of some kind of dinosaur hoop. Nowadays, I think just the standards are so much higher. People, people's expectations of what a memorable experience that they are, they want to share on social media are much bigger. And so the way that the industry responded to that has become increasingly innovative. No, people are drinking less. You know, it's, it's a big driver of that as well. I want to ask how about this one, but in, in terms of you have previously worked in social care. Yes, that's uh, right. Mental health aspects of that. And you reckon that this kind of immersion, this kind of getting out of yourself, if you, if you like, forget what Benjamin said to some extent here, that there are people who need to get out from the world in which they live, this, this virtual world. You reckon it helps them with loneliness, isolation and, and other aspects of yeah. the modern world? Absolutely. I mean, I've seen firsthand the power of games to bring people together, to form relationships, to uh, kind of build those social bonds. From my experience in mental health for seven, eight years, one of the biggest issues I saw was a lack of opportunities for particularly people using services or kind of with, you know, low level mental health diagnoses to get out into the community, do these kind of things, you know, in a, in a, in a social space. Um, so a big thing we do at Cakes and Ladders is running kind of well, what we call board games and wellbeing workshops. So we open those up to people uh, kind of using mental health services. We have a partnership with Mind in Haringey where we're based. And it's a great opportunity for people to come and meet new people. But, you know, you're not having a conversation across the table, which can actually be quite intimidating for, you know, for any of us. It's quite a high pressure situation. Instead, you've got a game in front of you. Someone can teach you how to play it. And suddenly you've got, you know, you've got rules, you've got a, a structure to socialise within. Um, and you've got new friends. Exactly that. And the games, the games allow you to kind of socialise and bond in a way that you might, you know, un otherwise not be able to. Um, but, you know, I, I think even on a, very, on a very kind of base level, you know, we know that things like anxiety, you know, socialisation, isolation as a result of, you know, use of social media, living in online worlds is on the rise and getting out with some friends, playing some games. Well, this goes back to some extent to what Benjamin said. Is he, he detests the fact that millennials are blamed for everything. But I suppose when it comes to isolationism, this could affect not that age group at all, but, but older people too. Absolutely. Yeah? And so that brings them out. Yeah. So it's uh, something for everybody here. Do you get many pensioners? 
Uh, we get a few. I think our oldest customer was about 85. Um, so we have everything from 18 to 85. And I think, yeah, like, there's not this focus on kind of the millennial age group. Um, and it's, I think that actually broadens the appeal of some. That a lot of people are, as Yasha says, trading it for like a traditional night out to a bar or a pub, which kind of quite often has quite a narrow age brand, depend, age band, yeah. depending on which one you're going to. So people are, oh, I'm a bit too old for this place, or I'm, oh, that's a bit too old for me. Or, whereas actually, when it's around an activity, you've got a much wider range. I mean, we, we gen, I mean, we've seen sometimes whole families come, three generations of the same family come to do axe throwing. Uh, and and it, does, it does provide that bond. Um, and as Hal was saying, with having that activity, you know, it's different from board games, but having an activity in the middle, the framework with which to socialize through means it takes the pressure off. I mean, that's why we see so many dates coming through to, to us. Like it just, it takes that pressure off because you've got that, that other thing that's taking the focus away and you can then kind of focus on that and then kind of dip in and out of the social bit as you kind of warm up to and it. And even if it's the first date, by the end of the evening, I'll probably have an axe to grind. <laughs> so, yeah. Something like that. We have a <laughs> hell of a lot of people come to us through Tinder, so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a big what, one What was fascinating about the role of uh, you know, the dating apps and yeah. in, yeah. in hospitality? Although I think we, we looked at our stats and our average date has 2.4 people on it, so... I mean, that's well, that, that's uh, certainly <laughs> usual, but that's, that's for another programme. Uh, Yasha, well, you two think about which is your favourite game in particular, because we'll come to that towards the end of the programme. You mentioned the hospitality mm. industry there. Jolly difficult to get into these days, mm. isn't it? So this is something new and entrepreneurial that could perhaps work, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it, dep it depends on your concept. So some concepts require less cash to start with. You know, for example, you, you could have get a old kind of double decker bus or you know perhaps um, an escape room the don't cost as much whereas some some of the concepts require millions of pounds of investment to set up and so the barriers to, to start some of these businesses are sometimes financial and actually increasingly technology led so tech even though you're, you're talking earlier quite interesting about you know how you might use them as an escape from technology increasingly the concepts are actually using technology to amplify the customer experience. Extraordinary looking at this yeah. document here, prepared by, among other people, Savills, who, who look after commercial property and residential property. It is very, very, very detailed. And it talks about competitive socialising as an offer that is good for landlords, tenants mm. and consumers. So let's talk about um, the business side of these things. Is it, you talk about the cost of setting some up, but if, if you're going for something pretty basic, um, like cakes and ladders, I mean basic in the nicest sure. possible way. You don't, it's just an, it has to be an original idea, doesn't it? Yeah. It doesn't so need to be expensive. It doesn't necessarily need to be expensive. And to be fair, the good thing about starting one of these businesses today is that given what's happening in the retail environment and the hospital environment, getting sites is easier than it used to be. So with You mean because so many people are going out BHS, of business? There, there's, uh, there's, House of there's, Fraser, Debenhams, you know, there's guys closing down actually is beneficial for the leisure industry because suddenly you've got massive amount of space coming into the market and landlords are kind of giving it away because you know they're struggling to find I, I, I read here that you need 25 to 30,000 square feet for, for probably urban golf yeah okay the bigger ones so let's say I wanted to go into Cheltenham not very far mm -hmm. from, from where I live and rent 25 to 30,000 square mm -hmm. feet would it cost me a fortune well is there a closed down uh, Debenhams nearby Probably. Well, let's assume there is. Then the well, then you'll probably get a very good deal at the moment. So this is this is where it's interesting as an investor. Can you give us a figure? Give us a figure. Can you? What in terms of? You say it's it's a good investment. It's very cheap. C can you say how much per square foot so that people know? In dust commercial properties going for anything. I think you can definitely get long rent rent free deals. You can probably I'm sure people I've heard people getting rent free deals for a year and a half, two years sometimes. Wow. I think sometimes people are paying. You could pay probably now 10, 10 pounds, 15 pounds per square foot, something like that. Then it becomes all about the fit out, doesn't yeah. it? Because actually, that, you, yeah. you may get the yeah. space very cheap, but to fill yeah. that with something that's meaningful, yeah. that costs a what, lot. Like a block of wood and an axe. Yeah, well, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to elevate a bit above <laughs> yeah. that now, but, but that's, you that's offer, where you we started. offer food and beverage as well, do you? Uh, we have a small, you know, limited range of refreshments at the moment, but all our sites that are opening up from now on, we will be yeah. offering a more complete experience with, with food and drink. So we'll have you know, pizza and a bar and things this like that. Is, so. This is where there's money to be made, isn't it? Do, do you find this? Once you've escaped or during your escape, do you get to eat a pizza or have a 
We don't do food and drink at our venue. The policy, in fact, we have on the website is that people are not supposed to come having had anything to drink. Of course, stag dudes inevitably ignore this sage advice and cause all sorts of havoc. We don't actually go in for food or drink because we have, the way we operate, um, we are limited with space. We have a single lobby. We have two rooms in each venue, so there's two separate teams who don't necessarily know each other using mm. the same lobby, and they don't go in at the same time. So if we did food and drink afterwards, we simply do not have the space which would allow but us to But would do it that. be but something that you could look into in the future if, you, if, if it was successful financially? Would it mm. be a, an, an add-on that you would consider? I don't know that it would not for us. I can see how it would for, for other people or for other, maybe even other escape games. I don't see how it would do much for us really. Uh, it's just not the way we're set up. And we've expanded already from the first venue that we opened in London Bridge to open one in Angel. So we are expanding. It is being quite economically successful, but we find that the costs that would probably be involved in, in introducing food and drinks offers um, would, I th I, I'm not going to speak for the bus, but I, I can't see how that would be economical for us. Well, outside your bus, I mean, the, the photographs on your website, Cakes and Ladders, are of people sitting at... Um trestle tables, um, those farmhouse tables, uh, playing their games and eating and drinking. You've got loads of beers on offer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is a big, important part of it as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, the food and drink offering is central to our business model, um, particularly, as I was saying to these guys before we started, people can spend five, six, seven hours there playing board games, if you believe it. So obviously they're going to need to get, have something to get them through that. Your yeah. idea of a brilliant night out? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I quite regularly go and... I, to other businesses in, in, the kind of, in the space. So, I mean, we went with the rest of our team to the Crystal Maze Live experience, yeah. which is sort of somewhere between, it kind of got an escape room theme feel to it, but it's based off the 90s TV show. Uh, and again, it's that- I think they brought it back not so very long ago, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. It was brilliant when it was first out. Yes, yeah, oh. but they, and they, they play on that, that nostalgia brings people in through mm. the door. I mean, I've been twice to the different sites, but um, it, it just, but that kind of competitive, nature of it, the, the game factor of it is the bring, thing that brings yeah. people together and, and keeps And it's back. the fact that people socialise, that, that, that brings... Absolutely, yeah. Now, you see, we did a programme not so very long ago about gaming um, as, a, as a big industry, and, as, and, and one of the people on it was a professional gamer, said, yes, they do feel like they socialise, but it is in, in a virtual mm. world. So if you were going out for a bit of fun, Benjamin, would you choose a virtual experience, or would it have to be something that was tangible? I think if I were going out for an experience, it would be tangible. Um, the advantage of virtual and the reason it, it's, you know, it is so popular is because you can do it from the comfort of your own home. I don't really see the appeal in going out for a virtual experience. If I'm going out with friends, I want to go somewhere where we are all interacting physically with, I was about to say each other, I don't want to take that to be taken the wrong way, but um, we're all interacting Other with human beings. whatever the purpose yeah. of the experience happens to be, whether it's just going to a pub or a club, someone around to someone's house to play a board game or out to play a board game, or even out to an escape room. Um, I, th I think if you're going out, if you're going to spend the money, if you're going to want to do something with your friends, make it a physical thing. You can play FIFA online all you want when you get home, but why would you do that? It's fascinating to see those bars opening up where they've got video games in the bars. Mm. Yeah. It's just quite interesting that how that's going to play out. So you actually go to a public place where you would socialise, but you end up playing something which is actually you on a screen. <laughs> I was offered the chance to go to a silent disco the other day, which is basically yeah. you put headphones on and you can't talk to anybody or be with anybody, but you listen to music. Imagine watching that from the outside. I mean, yeah. it must look... Anyway, that... that, that, that did that at Reading Festival. It's that, really bizarre. That, that's that's that another watch. story, isn't it? Do you think um, these young men and others like them are going to become uh, millionaires as a result of it? I hope so. Do you think, you think it's a great business model? Absolutely. I mean, we're looking to other activities as well. I think we're seeing more and more people wanting to, yeah, wanting to have an experience, wanting to do something they can talk about and can bond over, um, whether it's virtual or not. Some of it's, you know, it's that immersive personal experience. The trouble is, as you said to me, once you become quite successful, you, and this is the same in almost any business, you find yourself having to take a step away from what it was that got you there in the first place, the enjoyment of such a thing, to become a manager and an entrepreneur. Keep it small or expand? It's a really interesting question. I think board game cafes is a great example because there's not, there's not really one in the UK so far that has had that big boost of private investment, that kind of, it's all been, you know, hobbyists and people who are passionate about it like myself who thought right let me turn what I love into 
you know, into a day job. Um, so, yeah, in some ways, keeping small suits us nicely, but, you know, as long as, as, long as uh, it pays the bills. I think I know the answer to this since you're sitting next to me, but have you ever not managed to escape from a room? Um, despite working at an escape rooms, I'm actually awful at puzzles. So um, <laughs> I, I, I have a, a terrible r record of escape games. But I, I managed to avoid having to escape any of ours. There was simply no time to train me on them. So I learned them from the outside where I could be dignified. And then I pretend to customers that I know all the answers. <laughs> it's the Stephen Frank. Very, very quick uh, answer as we, it was the end of the programme. Yasha, um, is this the future or has it always been with us? I think it's always been with us and it's going to keep evolving over time as, as you know, amazing founders such as these find increasingly innovative ways to, uh, to satisfy people's desires for um, immersive, memorable experiences. Listen, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's brilliant. I, I, I'd, I'd like to come along if, if you'd put up with me at one of these places. So there. Don't, just don't give me the, the very sharp axe. George, thank you very much indeed. Uh, how lovely to see you, Benjamin, too. And Yasha, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for watching our, our edition of Fun and Games and Business, I suppose. For me, David Foster and the Roundtable team. Goodbye for now.